excited for our fourth and final workshop. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's exciting. It's an exciting moment, but also a sad moment. I hope you all sign up again. We're going to have new speakers. You're going to be matched with a new mentor. We're going to have new content. I think you're going to really enjoy it. But our, our workshop four topic is how to manage conflict in the workplace. This is a very big deal. And I think to maybe ask an early question, just to get the ball rolling on this topic, is when you're in a work environment, the question I have for you is, how do you want others to feel about you? Right in the comment section. I love to learn about it because what's so critical is the intentionality that we have about how others feel about us. I think so often when we're in a stressful work environment, we think about blaming other people. We think, well, XYZ person wants to sabotage me. They're always trying to, to undercut me or undermine my work. Um, or they just do these things just to frustrate me. But more often than not, I find that they don't do it on purpose. More often than not, I find that they don't even know that what they're doing is frustrating you. And so what I really want to open up for in terms of this conversation and this question is how do you want other people to feel about you? Because there might be something that you do that frustrates somebody else. You don't even realize that that's what you're doing because you maybe haven't set an intentionality. It just was the most convenient for you to do thing for you to do at the time. So you just kept on doing it. You had no idea that this frustrated other people. So right in the comment section, how do you want other people to feel about you at work? Do you want other people to think of you as reliable or dependable or hardworking or kind, friendly, always optimistic, nice, always having a good, positive, upbeat personality? How do you want other people to perceive you? I'd love to learn about that because ultimately this is your reputation. This is how other people perceive you. And this is so critical because I think it's so often it's so easy to blame others for the things that they do that frustrate us, but it's so easy to be blind to how what we could do might frustrate them. So if we can set an intention for how we want other people to feel about us, if we think about that every single morning when we go into work, our likelihood of actually fulfilling and embodying that persona, that person increases substantially. So I want to ask the question, how do you want other people to feel about you at work? Now, this is critical because ultimately this means that you're going to have to remove any other personal baggage to make sure that you're still staying consistent with how you want other people to feel about you. It doesn't matter if you found out your grandma just got diagnosed with cancer or that your dog just died or that you're having rough things that are going on in your relationship. It does not matter because at the end of the day, what matters is are you able to stay consistent to who you said you wanted to be? And the person that is the most professional, the person that is really bringing it every single time is the person that can stay the most consistent. Because if you start to let your personal stuff creep into your professional life, it is going to, it's going to open you up to potentially not being the consistent person, the consistent intentionality that you've set for how you want other people to feel about you. And I think it's really important that you really work towards doing that, which leads to the three keys to success that I've shared with you in every workshop, which is your strategy, your story, and your state. And fortunately, we know how to get ourselves into a state conducive for being successful. No matter what is going on in our words, no matter how mad, sad, angry, dejected we're feeling about anything going on, we can get ourselves into an emotional state conducive for being happy, even if it's for a temporary period of time, through our motion. So what I want to do right now is I want you all to stand up and I want you to shimmy it out. I want you to shake it loose. I want you to scream at the top of your lungs on the count of three, scream. One, two, three. Yeah, just let it out. Let it loose. Let it go. You've got nothing to lose. Who cares if other people are looking at you? You're probably in your house anyways with all the coronavirus craziness going on. You're probably in quarantine. This is the time to let loose. Because here's the thing, what we know is that when you are able to do that, you're getting your blood moving, you're getting your blood flowing in your brain, you're releasing endorphins in your mind, you're getting yourself into a state conducive for being successful. So by doing that, you are putting yourself, in for, you are taking yourself from wherever you were and you're putting yourself into a much more elevated status. That is how you stay consistent. No matter what you want other people to feel about you, if you can get yourself physically into a state conducive for being successful, other people are going to perceive you as whatever feeling you want to set for yourself. So that's critical. The other key is your story. What is the story you tell yourself for why you will or will not be successful? This is critical. If you tell yourself, well, I can't do that, or this is impossible, or I don't know if I have the abilities to do something like that, 
you're going to achieve the outcome that you've set for yourself. And it is ultimately going to lead to the outcomes that you you put on yourself. So if you tell yourself why you're going to be successful, if you tell yourself why you're going to make it work, you might have a chance of actually going out and achieving the outcomes that you want to achieve. Now, the last key is your strategy. What are the things that you can do on a daily basis to get yourself there? So maybe if you think to yourself, how do I want other people to feel about me? Maybe if it's it's to be kind. What can you do that's really kind on a daily basis to really reinforce that feeling you want other people to feel about you? If you want other people to feel that you are hardworking or confident or reliable, what can you do on a daily basis that will embody, that will reinforce you being kind, hardworking, or confident, or reliable? What are those things that you can do to set yourself up for success? That is your strategy. Those are the things that you can do on a regular basis. Now, the reason why this all relates to conflict management in the workplace is because these intentions about how we want other people to feel about us is critical to how to, to what we actually manifest at work. Now, it's so easy to get into a rut. It's easy to get frustrated. It's easy for other people, for us to blame other people for our problems. But here is a great way. This, this workshop on conflict management is a great tool for you to leverage to help you overcome a lot of the issues that you've got and that you've, you've essentially had for yourself at work. One of the biggest things that I'm a big believer, I'm a huge proponent of, is this concept called... Um, uh, um, is, is this, uh, this concept called observation, feeling, need, request. This is the key to nonviolent communication, which you might think, I'm not getting violent in the workplace. That's okay. But what I've observed is that this is one of the best ways to totally diffuse a situation. Whether somebody gives you a snide comment at work that you just didn't appreciate, or somebody made an action that you felt like just didn't respect you or your time or your abilities or that overall just frustrates you as opposed to getting pissed off, yelling at them, exploding at them, being passive aggressive and talking shit about them behind their back or anything that does not target the issue head on. Any of those actions are not productive. Observation, feeling, need, request is productive and can help you come to a solution. Now, here's how observation, feeling, need, request works. It literally follows the exact formula that I've laid out. Observation. What is the thing that you have observed? Now, the key with observation is that it's got to be undeniable. It happened, but there's no emotion to it. So, for example, the thing that really frustrates you is when John interrupts you at work. And let's say he just interrupted you three times in the course of a conversation. You can say, hey, John, I was hoping that we could chat for a minute. John says, yeah, sure. What's going on? You say, hey, um... So one thing that I observed is that in the course of this conversation, you interviewed, you, you interrupted me three times. Now you don't say you were being a jerk. You were being a dick. You interrupted me and, and really threw me off. Like none of, no feelings tied to it. Just you interrupted me three times. I started talking about this and then you cut me off and started talking about that. I started talking about this. You cut me off, started talking about that. And then I started talking about this and you cut me off and started about, started talking about that. It's the keys that it's undeniable. It happened. It's something that John can say, you know what? You're right. I did interrupt you three times. Um, now, it doesn't matter what his excuses were for interrupting you. The next part is the feeling. Now, the feeling is how do you actually feel about that? You're not here to call out John and call him out for being a jerk. You're here to say, hey, when I am interrupted, I feel belittled. I feel disrespected. And now this is the big part your need. Now, don't elaborate, by the way, when I say those feelings, don't elaborate on, on them. Just say, hey, I felt belittled. I felt, I feel belittled and disrespected. That's it. Everyone can relate to the feelings of being belittled and disrespected. Now, your need is critical because your need is like a higher level need that you've got that you believe the world should work like this. In a work environment, the work environment should work this way and that everybody can agree to that. And so your need is, you know what, hey, my, I, my need is that I work in a work environment where I feel like when I'm speaking, that I'm being respected and then I'm at least being heard. And now that's critical. If you put that out there, John can probably agree to that. The last part is request. Now, what is a request that you can make to John so then he can start to take action that ultimately um, it can, can, can formulate change? Now, you don't want to make it something that's concrete. You don't want to say, hey, my request is that you never interrupt me again. Unrealistic probably not going to happen. John may interrupt you sometime in the future, especially if he's weaning off this because it was a habit. But if your request is, hey, 
I, my, my, my request is that when I'm speaking, that you're conscious of what I'm saying and that you try your best to refrain from what, from interrupting me when I'm speaking. That's a very fair and valid request. John can probably agree to that because you're not asking for too much. You're just asking for him to be conscious of it. So that is how observation feeling need request works. It ultimately just lays out exactly what the thing that happened was, how you felt about it without calling out John or, or calling out the other person or talking about how bad of a person they were, um, sharing what your need is and your request for how they can implement that for the future. That is critical. Now, we're going to talk a lot about this later on tonight in this workshop with our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is an expert on conflict management in the workplace. I think you're going to really enjoy what our guest has to say. But those are my personal observations about what I've observed to work in observation in, in terms of conflict management. The last thing that I want to share before we jump into our guest speaker is this importance of teaching somebody else something that you've learned. One of the things that I've observed is that when people go through this workshop, when people go through this program, 20 is the magic number. If you tell 20 or more people about something you learned in this program, by the way, it doesn't necessarily need to be that you taught them a full seminar. It could be that you mentioned to your significant other or a friend, a peer, a colleague, hey, I learned about this thing called observation, feeling, need, request in uh, ambition and emotion workshop. That could be it. We know that when people tell 20 or more people about something they learn, anything they learn in this program, their likelihood of achieving their professional goals increases ex exponentially. And the reason why is because teaching something to somebody else reinforces that information in their mind. And so by doing that, by telling 20 or more people, the likelihood that this is going to stick, the likelihood that you are going to apply it in your professional environment, and the likelihood that you're going to achieve the professional goals that you've set for yourself, because that's been such a big focus of this program, increases exponentially. So what I would love for you to do after this workshop is to find somebody that you can teach something that you learned from this workshop this evening. I think that will really help reinforce what you're learning in this program, really help you make the most out of this experience. I'm so excited to dive into our guest speaker this evening. I really hope that, and I really encourage you to participate in the program. You're going to get a new mentor. We're going to have new content. We're going to have new speakers. I think you're really going to enjoy it. This has been a pleasure working with you all, and I look forward to the next steps. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our workshop this evening. I'm so excited to chat about how we can manage conflict in the workplace. You know what? It happens. Things happen. Some personalities just do not get together. They some people rub some other people the wrong way. Some things aren't communicated. Passive aggressive things happen. How do we handle it ourselves? How can we be professional about it? We've got an incredible guest speaker with us this evening. We have Sunshine Webster. Sunshine is the senior talent development partner for a financial software company called Q2. Sunshine is both an educator and an executive. Sunshine, thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about just conflict management and just in general, why does this, why, why did conflict happen? Why does conflict even happen at the workplace? It, you know, I think some people's mentality, like, especially if you're a college student or you're a recent graduate, you're in your career and you think to yourself, okay, I'm just going to enter into work. I'm going to do my job as best I can. I'm going to go home and, and be happy and be fine or look forward to the next day. But then something happens. Something, somebody says something that rubs you the wrong way or does something that just kind of irks you. Why does, why does workplace conflict happen? Probably the easiest answer to that is because we're human. Uh, because we're human and we're different, we have different perspectives, we have different experiences, different expectations. Uh, because of all those differences, conflict happens. And what's interesting about conflict, as we've all experienced, conflict can be a personality difference, like you just mentioned, where people rub each other the wrong way because of personality preferences. Maybe one person is a direct communicator and says things that are right on that person's mind. Maybe someone is more indirect, so they may take a direct person's comments as rude. So it could be because of personalities. But often in the workplace, we also have conflict over a topic or a substance. So it can be 
something that we're disagreeing about, maybe an idea, um, a process. Maybe I have an idea on what would make this process better. Maybe you have a different idea that you think, nope, this would be a better process. So conflict is going to happen because we're human, um, because we have differences, and we could have conflict because we have different personalities, or we could have conflict because we have different opinions. The interesting, probably most difficult conflict is when those two intersect, when we're having some disagreement or some conflict over a topic and our personalities get in the way at the same time. You know, it's really interesting you say that because I guess maybe the question I have for you is how often is it where the ultimate goal that two people are working towards is the exact same. The conflict, though, is about the way they're going about getting to that exact same goal. How often does that happen? Just like every day. And I love that you brought this up because I actually had this exact conflict yesterday. We are, my team is working on a big project, and it's actually one of our big goals for 2021. Uh, we had a goal setting session a few weeks ago and this was a goal that was placed on my plate. So my name was attached to it. So I'm the owner of this particular goal. Um, now everyone on my team wants to head in that direction. And so we're all on board with the end result. Yesterday in a meeting, one of my colleagues shared information about this goal. And again, remember the goal that it's mine, right? The goal that I own. This colleague started presenting information about it that one, I wasn't ready to share. And two, that sounded like it was more of a collaborative effort than I perceived it to be, um, which then made me have a physiological reaction to listening to all of this in the meeting. So, conflict in the workplace where we have the same end goal, but getting to that end goal is potentially different and that's what's causing the conflict. I would say happens just about every day. So let's talk about that. I love, I think the best way to handle conflict or work on handling conflict is to go through a specific precise situation. And so I know the bandaid has been recently pulled off. The wound might be a little fresh, but I'd love to dive deeper into it. So if I'm hearing you right, what happened was you were in a scenario where you were assigned a task. And my understanding is that this was your task and not necessarily a collaborative task. However, it seems like you work pretty closely with your team to incorporate them on some of the things that you're working on. Is that correct? That's correct. So even though I'm the owner, the leader of this particular task, it will require group effort to complete this task. Uh, and the way it was presented in the meeting yesterday appeared that it wasn't a group effort. It appeared that it wasn't mine. And it also appeared that we were ready to share information about this big goal that we weren't ready to share. So um, I, in the moment, um, I didn't say anything. Um, I could feel my hands get shaky. I felt my voice get shaky. I felt my heart race. Uh, I felt my stomach jump. So I had literal physiological reactions during this meeting. Uh, and my colleague, I generally, we don't have this kind of conflict. We do have different personalities. And I think that was the huge difference we were experiencing in this particular meeting. Um, so at the time our meeting was to end, it was continuing, but I sent a message to the group and I said, I have another call um, I'll reach back to each of you to follow up with um, our task at the end of this meeting. I knew I had to get out of there. I knew I had to leave, remove myself from the situation. So I removed myself. I took 15 minutes where I walked around. I calmed myself down. I did a separate task, like something that didn't involve this topic. And I thought to myself, I have two choices. I can go about my day and not address the conflict. I can forget that it happened or I can actually address it head on. So after my 15 minutes and I calmed myself down, 
I sent a message to my colleague and said, hey, I would love to connect. When you have a minute, let me know. And within five minutes, I received a response. Now, now works for me. Does it work for you? And I thought, all right, we're going to do this right now. And I decided to address the conflict head on. And I'm really glad that I did. It was hard. It was a difficult conversation, um, but I'm really glad that I did. Well, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And thanks for sharing that. So it sounds like the action by this other colleague of yours, it seemed like in, in your feelings almost felt like an act of insubordination. It felt like a, not necessarily an act of betrayal, but an act of like, hey, you went kind of behind my back sharing information that we weren't actually comfortable, that I wasn't actually comfortable with sharing. However, it also just, you know, playing devil's advocate, it seems like before that had happened, it wasn't clearly communicated potentially to this colleague that you weren't ready to share this information yet. Is that correct? It, was, it seemed like it was implicit. Correct. Completely. What this experience taught me, he doesn't have ESP. I learned that, that he can't read my mind. He can't read the thoughts, the plans, the intentions that are in my mind and vice versa. I can't read his. And what's interesting often when we are judging other people, we judge them by their behaviors, but we judge ourselves based on our intentions. And look at the difference between those two. I know my intent in this project, in not sharing information with stakeholders yet, I know that my intentions are good. But in the meeting yesterday, when I observed his behavior, I didn't assume that he had good intent. I exactly, as you mentioned, saw it as a potential betrayal, a, um, a lack, not insubordination, but a lack of collaboration. I saw it as he's not a team player. He's not in this with me. I didn't at all assume positive intent. And it was when we jumped on a call after that we were both able to share our intentions and that end goal. Remember, this brings us back to what started this conversation is we had the exact same end goal. We both want this to be a successful project. We're just not doing a good job collaborating on it. Yeah. And what has worked clearly for potentially him in the past is not necessarily has given has given him a tainted view of what he thinks will make him successful for this project which is different than your experiences in the past. So one, I want to take a moment to ask the audience, have you ever been in a scenario like this where you just did not see eye to eye with somebody else and you felt like the intent of this person was to backstab you in the back and, and, and try to sabotage you? If you've, if you've ever related, uh, post in the comment section. would love to learn about it. Maybe share a little bit of details in the story. I, I think that would be really insightful. But Sunshine, back to your point, I, I think your perspective on all of this is very mature because at the end of the day, you could have gone home, you could have gone to your family and said, oh my gosh, this guy is trying to sabotage me, he hates me, he doesn't like working with me, he, he's trying to sabotage this whole project um, because he's just trying to just strong arm everything and you didn't take it like that. You took time to breathe, formulate a calm, coherent thought and then go to him and actually confirm with him. And I think that's so powerful because I think, I think that there's a fine balance between being strict and, you know, you could have, you could have in, in the conversation in an angry scenario gone to him and said, Hey, that's not the way we do things. That's not how I want this project to run. This is my project, not your project. We need to do it this way. You could have said it like that, but instead you said, Hey, I would love to learn. Why, why did you bring that up? What are some of the reasons you brought? You sought to understand before being understood. And I think that is what makes you a great leader and makes the story a really, really powerful story. Thanks for sharing that, Sunshine. Sure. So I guess, uh, and yeah, what, go ahead. What was really interesting when I approached the conversation, I love that you brought up, I could have gone in and said, um, this is how it needs to be done. I'm the leader of this project. And instead, I approached the conversation with, we need to be more collaborative. We need to present a unified front. So I positioned both of us as leaders of this project. Uh, and when I presented it that way, he followed up with, 
tell me more, help me understand, because he didn't understand. And then I focused on, I said, I'm going to be direct and I'm going to be honest. I had a physiological reaction to that meeting and I shared with him how I felt and I kept it focused on me and not once did I say, you did, you said, I said, I feel, I feel shaky hands, I feel this, I feel that. And when I shared with him how I felt, I saw on his face the concern, the, how him thinking that I had those kind of reactions upset him because that wasn't his intention. And that's when we came to the realization, okay, we both have the same end goal here. Let's talk about how we're going to get there and how we're going to collaborate together to get us there. And that was the end of the conflict. We scheduled a meeting to talk about our specific roles on this project and make a plan for how we're going to bring in key stakeholders. So I think that clarity is going to um, help both of us. So I think that message is really powerful. If you ever have conflict with somebody, targeting it immediately, seeking to understand before being understood, sharing in the form of your feelings, not what they did to you, is so critical in all of this. But what if we didn't do that? What if we're in a scenario where you're like, okay, you know what? This is incredibly insightful. I wish I would have known this information six months ago. What can I do now to try to squash the beef and have a better working relationship with those colleagues that I might not have seen eye to eye with? So that may have been my previous um, approach. A few months ago, I had an issue with one of my team members and I became, again, very frustrated. And I, did, I, just, I didn't address it with the person because at the time I thought they're only gonna get mad, they're not gonna understand. I made a bunch of assumptions before uh, that I just assumed the conversation was going to unfold a certain way, not even giving them the benefit of the doubt. And instead I went to my manager and I said, I need your help working with this person because this happened, this happened, this person. And do you wanna know what my manager asked me? She said, have you thought about giving this person feedback? Just that question it made me go, no, why, why would I give feedback? You're my manager. Aren't you supposed to like go and fix and solve all my problems for me? So um, yesterday when I had this experience, I had that conversation in the back of my mind because after like a few months ago when I had that initial experience and she said, have you thought to give this person feedback? So I took her advice and I did give this person feedback um, in terms of how I approached the conversation by saying, how is it best to work with you? What are some suggestions and tips for the best way to work with you? That ignited a conversation between the two of us where I shared, here are my preferences, here's the best ways to work with me. And since then, we have been able to work better together. So I think it's easy to have the conflict and to avoid it altogether and say, well, we just don't get along or we just don't work well together or to run to my manager and say, I need you to fix this because it's just not working. And instead, I really love that she put it back on me to say, well, have you given him feedback? How is this person going to know if you don't give him feedback? Uh, and so that gave me the fuel I needed yesterday to then address it head on. Um, so maybe when I find myself in this situation, I'll continue to have that kind of courage because, yes, it did take some courage. It did take some courage, but I think there's a lot of power to that. And I think that, I, I, well, one, the, the ability to address it immediately is so critical. I'm a big fan of Radical Candor by Kim Scott. And one of the things that she essentially says is to – immediately give feedback. There's so much power of being specific and immediate because if you're not specific and immediate, if, if it's not immediate, it, it, it won't resonate in somebody's mind. Essentially, there's these things, everybody gets into patterns. And if we can disrupt the pattern the moment it happens, we can cause them to change their action. But if they're already moved on to a new pattern or a new way of doing something, it won't disrupt their mental pattern of that and it may occur again. So the importance of immediacy is so critical, but the other component is specificity. What specifically was the thing 
that I felt frustrated me and targeting that. Don't, don't necessarily go from the saying that you're a jerk, but saying specific things. You did this. My feeling is frustrated. And my need is just having a work environment where we're on a unified front and we're coming together and collaborating well. My request is that, you know, if you, you have the urge to share things that you don't actually know if it's okay with sharing, maybe we discuss it before the meeting itself with other stakeholders. Um, so I know I'm leveraging a little bit of Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, uh, you know, keys to nonviolent communication, but I, I think that, um, I think that absolutely resonates here. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So, I guess the question I have is, well, it, it, I, I want to dovetail this to a slightly it, like relevant, but it's an interesting point that you're bringing up. And, and it's around this idea of being comfortable with bringing up certain behaviors, things, and having the courage to bring it up and why that's so important. And I think, and this is something that I've recently learned. We, we had a, a lunch and learn guest. Her name's Amy Wanninger, and we talked about overcoming unconscious bias. And unconscious bias not only can go between race, gender, age, um, like demographic information, but it can go based on, you know, work environments and certain things. And one of the things that Amy had educated me on was this notion that what potentially me as a white man, um, what I am comfortable with bringing up, somebody else might not be comfortable with, and I might not be consciously aware of how other people feel about that because I've never received negative repercussions for doing something like this. And that's potentially in the scenario and the story you brought up could be potentially the scenario that he's faced. Maybe he never ever has received negative feedback around bringing up things that maybe aren't fully accomplished yet. And so therefore he thought, well, why don't I just bring it up to stakeholders? It'll you know, maybe think that we're really on a good track. And in reality, you, you were not too not too happy about that i guess is there what are your thoughts on that i know this is kind of like in a different but i think i think it's a relevant component of the topic of how our gender our even our race our age differences can impact how we handle different circumstances and different situations in different ways i love that you brought up unconscious bias um because what we know is that if we have a brain we have unconscious bias we know that it's a given. Um, we are often not aware of the ways of our preferences, of what we lean towards, what we support. Um, oftentimes they're embedded in our gender, in our race, in our um, past experiences. So if I have had a difficult time Maybe I've worked in an environment in the past where my ideas weren't supported or where conflict was handled in a very negative way. Maybe I had a boss in the past that yelled. Um, I don't know how many people have seen the Netflix, the brilliant jerks. Um, maybe I had a brilliant jerk as a boss. And so I bring that to work and those assumptions, those unconscious assumptions that I don't realize until after. And I only realize them after the fact when I start to unpack them, right? I only realize them if I take the time to look inward and look at the potential role I played in this, in this conversation. Um, so if you think about unconscious bias, often we think is an awareness issue. We're just not aware. Um, it's not an awareness issue. It's a biology issue. We have bias. What we can do about it is we can be thoughtful and intentional in our communication. We can focus on the things we can control. We can ask good questions um, and we can view conversations as a relationship, not as a one directional where I have an idea and I tell it to you. Conversations are relational. We create and construct meaning together and so when you think about conflict in that, I guess from that perspective, conflict isn't me telling you, here's what you did wrong. Conflict is us coming together to make sense of how we can do this better. Um, I also love that you brought up radical candor because a key component to radical candor is caring sincerely caring about the other person. And if this is a person you work with 
and your success, their success, all the success is matter. It's intertwined and matters together. We should care about how we interact with each other. We should care how we manage conflict together. We should care about our relationship and having that mutual understanding. That is so wise. Sunshine, you are so smart. That is, I think, one of the most, that's really profound, kind of what you said. It's a very mature, very profound, very educated kind of response to all this because you're so right. I mean, the mere concept of if we have a brain, we've got bias, insinuates and helps us realize that when someone does something that frustrates us, it's not on purpose. They are not trying to sabotage us. They are trying to achieve oftentimes the same goal we are or their own goals, which helps move the business forward. But it's done in a way that we would not have done it. And that's theirs to choose or ours to inform them and be informed of so then we can be more educated about where they're coming from and not just assuming the worst and being passive aggressive about it. Because that, you know, keeping it to yourself, bottling it in doesn't help anybody. And it certainly doesn't help the person that you go to, to to decompress about it because oftentimes they're taking the victim mentality and not necessarily a growth mentality about how they can make the situation better. It's only just frustration about how somebody else is making their life worse. So Sunshine, I'd love to ask, what if we're working with somebody that we're relying on their work to get our stuff done? and we have a little bit of conflict with them. How should we handle something like that? Oh, yes. Group work doesn't change when you're out of college. <laughs> it gets exponentially larger um, because when we work in organizations, we are all dependent upon each other to be successful. Um, I'm thankful in that I work for an organization that is mission driven. So our all of our employees that gives us that North star that we're all working towards doesn't change the fact that the dependencies that we rely on each other for cause a great deal of conflict because not everyone hits deadlines. Not everyone is able. Um, my organization is a software company. When you, if anyone who deliver, who develops and delivers software knows that deadlines are hard to hit, unforeseen bugs or um, any complications that arise in the development and delivery of the software changes that a customer wants or client wants to make. Um, so deadlines become tricky. One piece of advice that I have when we are dependent on others is having a clear project leader, having clear project deliverables, and all of that really stems from having a clear project plan. Um, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. And if you notice, a word that I used in all three of those was clear. Um, so I'm going to use one of my favorite Brene Brown quotes. And that clear is kind. When we can provide clarity for people, when we help people understand the direction and the clarity of direction. So whether it's deliverables, timelines, plans, that clarity helps people understand the direction and what's ex and expectations that sets expectations for everybody who's involved in the project. Most of the time when we aren't clear, people fill in those blanks. They create their own expectations. They create their own assumptions. And then I become frustrated because your assumptions and expectations aren't the same as mine. So providing clarity on a project becomes incredibly important. So um, I think Brene Brown can help us there with just, it's kind, when you can be clear, um, it's kind to the folks that we're working on the project with. Clarity is kind, I love that notion. Uh, for anybody watching this, take a moment to rewind by about a minute and a half, re-listen to what Sunshine just said. I thought that was so powerful because I was just about to talk about expectations. It can be so easy to get frustrated at somebody, if, but if we haven't set the expectations just from an accountability perspective, it's not really on us. And you might think to yourself, well, what if I'm not in a management position? 
can I still set expectations? And the answer is, of course, you can set expectations. Because if you don't set expectations, people are going to keep asking you to do more and more things until you kind of hit your pushing point. And if you don't keep doing it, you're going to end up feeling burnt out and frustrated. So it's on you to communicate to your manager what your expectations are. And if you are the manager, it's up, up to you to communicate to your team what your expectations are. But, Sunshine, I'd love to ask, and I know I've been guilty of this before, have you ever been in a scenario where you set expectations and then for whatever reason you couldn't uphold them? How do you handle something like that? So if I'm understanding your question, um, I kind of hear two facets to this. So when I set expectations that I haven't followed through with, so maybe I'm leading this project and I say, here's expectations, here's the deliverables, and I fall short, that's one case. And then the other case would be when my fellow members on the project fall short. So I'm going to deal with when others fall short and then I'm going to focus on when I fall short. Um, so first, if I'm leading a project and others fall short, the best way to approach that from my perspective is to put it all out there, revisit the project plan and talk and ask good questions, good coaching questions. So rather than tell people, I can't believe that you, did, you missed this deadline where, oh, the project is, you know, far behind. Instead of wallowing, instead of dissecting the past, let's stay future focused. So questions that I would ask my colleagues are, where are we stuck? What is getting in the way? What can I do to help you be more successful? These kinds of questions will allow people to start working through why they haven't been able to hit the mark. Some of this will also be incredibly insightful for me to understand, maybe I set the mark too high. Maybe I'm not providing the support on the project I can. Maybe there's other people I can bring into this project that can provide additional support and help. The more questions that I can ask, the greater I'll understand why they're having trouble missing the mark. Remember, we often judge others by their behaviors. If I just give that feedback and I don't ask and seek to understand, I'm not understanding their intent. I'm just assessing their behavior. So by asking big questions, I can assess their intent. And it can be helpful to me to understand what I can do to help them. So that's, if I'm leading the project, my goal is project completion and if that's my goal, I need to be supportive all along the way. And if people are stuck, it's my job to help them get unstuck. So let's flip this coin around. What happens when I miss the mark? I own it. I own it. I have to be straightforward and say, I missed it, guys. I know this is what I said. I missed it. And here's what I'm doing moving forward. So again, it's future focused. If the team wants to understand where I fell short, like why from the past, I'm happy to own it and explain what barriers I uncovered, like what barriers I faced. But only if that's important to them. I'm not going to have a project meeting and unload on them and tell them, oh, this, I ran into this, I ran into this, unless it's important for them, unless they want to have that. I'd rather focus on Here's what we're doing to move this forward. Here's where I fell short, and here's what I'm doing to address it, correct it, and fix it moving forward. So in both scenarios, staying future-focused is incredibly helpful and important. So the team sees we're not just going to wallow. We're not just going to remain stuck, but rather we're going to get unstuck. Here's how, and here's what the future looks like. I love that insight, Sunshine. So I'd love to take a moment to ask the audience a question really quick. What can you do right now within your own workplace to better set your own expectations, set expectations for work in general, both even if you're a manager or you're not a manager, what can you do right now to start better setting your expectations? Post in the comment section. And then I'd love to also learn how will you handle a scenario if you're not able to uphold your own expectations? How will you handle that? Post in the comment section. I'd love to learn about it. I think it's it's really cool to kind of set ex in, intentions from a workshop like this so we can leverage what we're learning and actually start 
setting that mindset into that we want to actually set our mindset on something that we want to accomplish and start actually doing in our own life to make a change. So Sunshine, I'd love to, we're kind of getting onto this point right now, but it's, it's on the topic of feedback of, of how do we, how can we best offer feedback to people, both managing up. So we're not the the manager at our company, but we're, we're talking to our manager, but also managing down. How can we best offer feedback to people, both positive and negative? So the research on feedback is so interesting. What we've learned neurologically about feedback is that when people give and receive, so both the giver and the receiver are giving feedback that's constructive and difficult, our brain waves look the same as when we're listening to nonsense. So when somebody is giving me difficult feedback, it is really hard and difficult feedback that I didn't ask for, that I didn't want. My brain really struggles to unpack it, to understand it and to use it and apply it. So some of the best advice that I give folks in our organization and outside our organization is try to flip it around instead of being giver centered where I'm walking around giving feedback. Let's make it receiver center and let's start asking people for feedback. That is the message I tell people. And in fact, I challenge um, all the leaders who in our organization who do any work with me or my team, I challenge them to ask for feedback every single day. Um, so for 30 days, keep a tally. I keep a sticky note on my computer with tallies every day that I ask for feedback. I give myself another tally. Um, and here's what happens when we start asking for feedback. We get better feedback, better quality feedback, more feedback, and it becomes reciprocal because as I start asking people for feedback, they start asking me for feedback. So if we want to start to change the culture and try start to make feedback easier to give and receive, the best thing we could do is start asking for feedback instead of waiting for it to magically appear. When you ask people, do you receive the amount of feedback like enough every day? Nobody ever says, yes, I receive an adequate amount. Everyone wants more. Well, if we want more feedback, let's start asking for feedback. That's a great strategy. I never heard that notion that when our brain waves are hearing feedback, that it's like as if we're hearing nonsense. That's pretty crazy to me. It makes a ton of sense. I personally am guilty of being very defensive. Like it's, like in immediately when you hear feedback that you're not expecting, like all of a sudden my defensiveness kind of like barrier walls get put up. And I think it's totally understandable. So I think the notion of asking for it makes a lot of sense. Um, the Neuro Leadership Institute in London that's led by um, a researcher, Dr. David Rock, they have done some of the most interesting brain and physiological studies on feedback. And what we've seen is when both giver and receiver, so a manager who has to give difficult feedback or an employee who has to receive difficult feedback, our blood pressure increases, our heart rates increase, our um, cortisol, the stress hormone levels increase in addition to our brain activity. So if you think about what's happening physiologically and neurologically, when we're dealing with difficult or constructive feedback, it's like it's not working. It's, we're all missing the point of getting better because our bodies aren't able and our brains aren't able to take in that kind of information. We put up these threat responses that are very similar to physical threats. Our brain thinks, I'm in danger, I'm in danger. So we put up a wall, just as you mentioned, and so if we want to start breaking down that wall, we've got to start asking people for feedback instead of waiting for it just to be given to us. That makes so much sense. You know, what I'd be curious to know is back to your initial example of that guy that's on your team, how did you handle that situation? Was there a way that you, I guess the, when you went into that conversation with him after having 15 minutes of kind of regrouping, I guess how can we ask for feedback in a way that's not kind of, I don't want to say like gaming the system, but in a way that we're not like, Hey, like, can you give me some feedback? Great. Right, Cause I'm ready to deliver you some feedback. Um, how can we go about doing this in a way that is intentional, that's meaningful, 
and you know when a actual stressful situations happen how do we how do you differentiate between that i guess that's the question i'm asking so it's the way that we ask for feedback is incredibly important to make this work i could ask a big question how did i do how did that work if i ask a question that large it's really hard to get good quality feedback because <clears throat> typically people say it was great you did great well, that's not the kind of feedback I want. So I can be more pointed in the way I ask for feedback. If we go back to my example at the beginning, um, the difficult conversation I had yesterday with my colleague. We have a meeting scheduled next week to talk about this project. My intention is at the end of that meeting to say, I'd like to go back to the conversation that we had that brought this up in the first place. And my intention is to ask him, how, how can I better handle a situation like that? I want to receive feedback from him to see, did I handle it the way that helped him best? Is there another way that would help him better? So for that particular experience, I'm going to follow up with asking him about when we find ourselves in these situations, what is the best way for us to handle this? The second thing that we're also, we're doing this as a team, we are providing each other with a feedback frame so that when we start asking each other feedback, we have a frame to use. And a feedback frame might be um, something as simple as asking a fill in the blank question. When I, let's say, when I presented the project, how effective were my ideas? that would be a way to ask for feedback. Or when I resolved the conflict, how helpful was my approach? Notice all of these are very specific, very clear, and hopefully also very recent. I'm not asking, back in May, when I presented to our manager, how was, I'm not asking people to remember back in May. I'm asking people to remember yesterday or, um, I can even ask before, say, I'm about to present a new idea. Will, and I can ask different team members. I can ask one, say, will you pay attention to how I organize my message? And I can ask somebody else, will you look at the visuals in my PowerPoint and tell me how effective the visuals were? I can ask people or prime them in advance. So I'm not asking them after the fact to force them to, to remember something specific. So I can ask for something very specific after, or I can prime people before and have them really focus in on something. And notice, let's say that my slides were terrible and I asked one of my team members to really focus on the visuals. Well, when they give me feedback, I'm ar I already know they're gonna tell me about my visuals. So when they come back and say, slide number three was really difficult to understand that's not hard for me to receive because I already know it's coming. If instead, I didn't know if after the presentation, this person just walked up to me and said, slide number three was really difficult to understand. That might've been harder for me to receive because I wasn't expecting it. So we can help ourselves receive conflict, I mean, receive feedback a whole lot easier and reduce the conflict if we can prime people and ask for it well in advance. Sunshine, you are a wealth of information. This was incredible. I'm so grateful to have had you here for our workshop this evening. Um, final question for you. I know a lot of our, our participants are heavily on LinkedIn, using LinkedIn. How can our audience connect with you and learn more about your work? Are you all right with it if they connect with you on LinkedIn? Absolutely. I'm super easy to find on LinkedIn because I have such an unusual name. Sunshine Webster, and yes, Sunshine is my real name. Um, but no, my parents weren't hippies. So I'm pretty easy to find. Um, if you just type in Sunshine Webster, I may be one of the only ones that pops up. Sunshine, you're incredible. Thank you so much for being here. Our, everybody who's in our audience, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. See everybody.